This is Computing Up, conversations about computation writ large, with Michael Littman and Dave Ackley. This episode was recorded August 24th, 2020. And we are back. Hey, Michael, how's it going? <laughs> that was a really long commercial, Dave. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that's what life is. It's a commercial between podcasts, computing ups. Um, yeah, I'm I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, I feel like summer is winding down, which makes always always makes me a little sad. My birthday comes at the very end of August, and so it always felt kind of mixed to me. So just uh-huh. kind of kind of a sad time to have a birthday. So because a birthday is good, but the end of summer is bad, uh, so they kind of fight with each other. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. You don't have and like it's that, fun to celebrate uh, with people. Growing up, like it wasn't school, so I didn't have school friends, and it was after camp, so I didn't have camp friends. So it was really uh, just see. like you know, summer was winding down, family. and I was alone. Yeah. Oh yeah, family. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah, that. Uh, uh, I see. Uh, uh, so it, it's it, it's not the uh, getting ready for the crisp notebook, new pencil, back to school thing. That that was a. Uh, uh, a plus for the end of the summer. I do like autumn. That's true, and I like the stars that come out in autumn. I got I got attached to them. Uh, but you know this this year, like both kids are going to be out of state, so we're going to wow. just going to be us guys. Uh, but you both you and I, neither of us are prepping for class right now, and it's like classes That's will start, true. and we're I'll be on sabbatical, and and you're because you're on, on sabbatical ish. Uh huh. Have you got a high concept of, of thoughts you're going to think? While sabbaticaling, or well, I mean, I'm trying just to write do the a research. book. So yeah, oh, yeah. good job. Is well, that a we'll title? see. Uh, something like the four ways we tell machines what we want them or computers what to do and how we could do better. Uh huh. Uh huh. So the, the, getting the research out there, uh, doing the outreach. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's the thought. Getting getting people to know about computing. Because, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm really interested in sharing computing with the broader audience. <laughs> oh, wait, that's well, what we're doing you know. right now. Hey, well, that's, that's what we tell ourselves anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I got an well, email hey. today from, uh, from a high school student in Austin, Texas, who, at least for the purposes of the email, says that he is an avid listener. Great. Uh, well, that's cool. Well, so to tell you what, here, here's uh, what I'm hoping to do today. Uh, um, I have been thinking a whole sort of class of thoughts for a, a long time, uh, at least seven years since I've actually started talking about it a little bit. And I want to get back and try it again. Speaking of getting computing out more broadly, that's what this is about. So what I'd like to do uh, is kind of run some by uh, you, Michael, and just, just get, get what you're thinking. In particular, um, you know, if things, you say, well, what about this? Downsides, you know, I, uh, push back as much as you feel comfortable with, uh, because, because that's what I need. And part of the reason I want to do this is because, you know, historically I would have this super perfection thing where I wouldn't want to talk about anything until it was done. Uh, um, and that now I think that's a mistake. And, and I think it's better to get as much feedback from people as you can. And that means if somebody who's hearing a later iteration of it, already heard some earlier versions of it, well, that's okay. Uh, um, even if it means for them, any particular joke might not be new. <laughs> uh, it's still better to try out the material than it is to hide it all in private and, in fact, never get it out there at all. Interesting. Well, this this is, this is a bit of a change for you because I can remember several kind of philosophical statements you've made to me through the years that kind of go counter to this. There's one that you, so? you make a big distinction between speaking and uh, writing. So that's one. Yes, exactly. And so we, we should probably yes. remind people what that is. And the other one was yeah. – you had this great phrase. Oh man, I'm not going to remember it exactly. This I'm I'm sort of the most useless receptacle of your wisdom. Um, it was something <laughs> uh, like <laughs> it was something like uh, you know like uh, guru by day, something like that. Or or and you know. Wow. But but the but the basic idea of it was you. See, I, this was very early on when I was, you know, yeah. sit, sitting sitting at your feet, you know, receiving all all the, all the amazing <laughs> thoughts that you had to share, and um, and I said something, and you replied something, 
The details are not important right now. <laughs> this is great. Uh, <laughs> let me let me paint this vivid story for you. Um, and and it, and I just it floored me. Like your response was, I thought I had had such an original thought, and you just had this perfect little counter to it. And I was like, uh-huh. I don't understand how you did that. Like I don't understand how you yeah. had that thought in the first place. But then to give it to me in tempo like that, just it just blew me away. And you're like, you have to understand, you know, guru by day or something like that. But the basic yeah. story that you told is that is when you're on the clock, when you're actually having a conversation with people, that's when you can actually share the huge amount of pre-compiled information that you've been doing off the clock. And so you can actually be right. really quite clueless and bumbling off the clock as long as you come away with some cool things to share. And then it can sound like, oh, yes, well, here, let me tell you about this thing. Does that, mean, right. does that bring any yeah. bells? No, well, uh, the, the exact phrase doesn't ring a bell, but the general concept for sure. I mean, there uh, there was a, a, a line from some book I read in my liberal arts undergraduate days <laughs> that I thought was uh, the red and the black, the scarlet and black, but I actually went back and looked at the book and mm-hmm. I couldn't find the line. So I'm not sure now wh- what novel this came <laughs> from that I read as an undergrad. But the idea was the main character uh, was just in, the, in her room or something thinking about stuff and came up with a great line uh, uh that uh, you know would be a great zinger or a great comeback or whatever it was uh, um and then she was like oh that's too bad that i thought of it now because now it would be inappropriate to use it as if i had just thought of it uh, uh in tempo in some future time and and that thing completely stopped me because that's all i ever do mm. is uh, imagine possible circumstances and say well this would fit in or well then this would be a concept and so forth mm. and thinking them and thinking them thinking them so that exactly it does work out that way and then if you get enough of that stuff then hopefully in tempo the good You're stuff prepared. will pop out yeah uh, um so i don't know um and the speaking versus writing distinction to me is, uh, it's much, I have much lower sort of moral, ethical, mm-hmm. business, uh, reputation obligation when I'm speaking than when I'm writing. But when I'm being recorded speaking, is that really <laughs> speaking or uh, is it now in writing? The yeah, line it's is kind- blurred. It's kind of in between. And in fact, I now sort of believe that you have to just go with the context. If the recording is mm-hmm. obviously meant to be standing and giving a speech at the Nobel Prize, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. If it's supposed to be a computing up episode, that's another thing. Where it's a conversation uh, and, and it's, it's framed as a spontaneous conversation. So it should be taken that Exactly. Way. So even if it's recorded and the aliens in the year 3000 are watching <laughs> this and going, what the hook? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that's they're going to have to. Think, yeah. yeah, that's how they express surprise <laughs> in the year three thousand. Uh, um, <laughs> anyway, so so that was the plan w- was to was to try out some of this material and just and just see what you think. Um, and and we'll just go until we've gone too long, and then we'll stop. Okay. Uh, um, all right. So I guess you know one of the big problems I have with all of these ideas of living computation and living systems and computational systems are the same class of systems, uh, uh, it seems to me, is trying to figure out where to begin to explain it to people. Because mm-hmm. there's just so many different consequences of it. And I've worked out many different consequences. And that's part of why I'm so much better when I'm in a discussion. Because people will give me an opening and then I can tailor uh, the stuff to that. But if I'm just supposed to haul out in forward, then how do I start? So one of the ways I started back in 2013 was pretending to do a class, a YouTube video class on classical hyperspace. And it was called an introduction, an introduction to classical hyperspace. (laughs) And I did one video. (laughs) <laughs> which drives me crazy because if there's anything I hate, it's under construction signs because they're, they're so totally lame. Uh, um, and now it's seven years later and I've never done lecture two. Mm. Uh, um, and I really want to. So over the last couple of months, I've been collecting material mm. for lecture two of introduction to classical 
hyperspace. Uh, um, so this, I want to try out some material. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and so now, now in all, in in the spirit of openness, I feel like I've watched several episodes of the of the Hyperspace Academy. <laughs> so it's possible that I watched the one and just remember it as being more than one. But I, I have at be. least watched the one. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I could have sworn yeah, I watched uh, yeah, there, three, but okay. It's there's fine. there's it's there's ch- there's chili peppers and there's graphs and there's uh, various and there's bit vectors dimensions. and stuff. Yes, bit vectors. dimensions and bit vectors. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, and so this is now I'm trying to back up and and get a run toward that. The, theoretically, lecture two is about hyper subspaces, mm. uh, um, and. Uh, hyper subspace is you have a giant bit vector, uh, uh, where some of the positions have wild cards in them. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's like, this is a one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, star, star, one, 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 star, zero, whatever, like that. All right. Well, and, maybe, maybe, maybe before we get to hyper subspaces, maybe we should do at least a, a brief recap of hyperspace. All right. So yeah, if, yeah. All so right. what's your simplest kind of setup for that idea? Because I'm well, very so comfortable the, with bit vectors, so that right, could be okay. Right. Well, that's true. Well, so the idea is the, the world is full of distinctions. Is this thing red or black? Is it big or small? Is it mine or not mine? Can I eat it or not? And so on. And we can imagine, just fantasize in our head, that things could be represented by the sum of all of those decisions. That any particular thing is, yes, it's edible, no, it's not red, no, it's not mine, yes, it's small, and so on. And right, you so could imagine this having... So like a list. It's like a concatenation of all these different feature uh, values. That's right. Yeah, not not actually adding them up, just keeping them all okay. around. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a bit vector. And so if we have a zero or one for every... Every position on that bit vector, we have answers to all of our questions, all of our yes/no questions. This one says yes, this one says no, and so on. All right, and, and that represents and like a thing that could be in the world. That represents a thing, a state of affairs, the entire universe, something. Okay. Uh, um, and so, step two is: well, suppose you have two different bit vectors, uh, um, and uh, so you got this set of, and they're the same size because they're the same set of questions, mm. but they may have a different set of answers. So they have in any given position, they might have the same value or a different value. And so then here's the idea. If you take those two bit vectors and you compare them, then every place that they, they have the same answer, every question, they say, is it mine? No. The other guy's no. So neither of them mine. So in comparing these two bit vectors, they, neither of them is mine. So that's not an important distinction. But the question, is it green? One of them says yes, and the other one says no. So they're different there. And some other question, like, is it bigger than a bread box? One of them says yes, the other one says no. So if you have two bit vectors and you put them up against each other, you get a set of positions, a set of questions where they have the same answer and a set of questions where they have different answers. And so if you imagine taking all possible combinations of the place where they disagree, you get a little subspace, a little set of possibilities where it's all about things that aren't mine, but it might be green or not green. It might be bigger than a bread box or not like that. All right. So we're, the we're more talking place- now we have like a whole space of possible vectors and the vectors in the space are the ones that m- match both my vector and your vector. We've got two vectors. Right. All these new vectors all have to match where the previous two matched, but where they differ, right. they're allowed to differ. And, and we are imagining right. all possible ways of filling in those differences. Exactly. So for, for each decision, each question where they disagree, they might take your choice for that decision or they might take my choice for that decision. Right. And it's independent. And you go okay. on to the next one where we disagree and it might be yours and it might be mine. So okay. it, in that in that space, there could be combinations of answers that you like and answers that I like that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, uh, there might not be any green thing that's smaller than a bread box or whatever it is, but that's still part of the of the subspace. If you were thinking of a big green thing and I'm thinking of a small red thing, 
uh, uh, like that. All right. So this is so and, this is mapping to me to. I'm going to say uniform crossover without mutation, but I don't know if that's yeah, a universal it, way of viewing it. But basically, the idea is yeah. if you think about um, like two people have a baby, and the places where the like features that the the parents both have in common, like they both have brown red eyes, hair, yeah, and brown right, eyes, whatever. Then it is. we expect that the baby will have those things. But for other features, like one is musically inclined and the other one isn't, well, then it's a you know. Is the kid going to be? Well, we don't know. It could be. It could take. Yeah, and from and be co- tall or not tall, and so on. Okay. And so it might be the case, in fact, that there are some relationships between the places where the parents are different. So mm-hmm. it will not actually produce musically inclined and tall for some reason that we don't know. Mm. But the idea is, when we're talking about hyper subspaces, is we make the assumption. That if you have these two bit vectors, that generates a subspace, which is all the wild cards everywhere they differ. And the size of that subspace is two to the number of questions that they differ on, because that's how many different ways you could fill in ones and zeros for the disagreeing decisions. Um, and we assume that those are all equally likely. Uh, um, even though, in fact, in any real situation, they be- probably won't be. They may well not be. But this is an assumption we make. Okay. And so the idea is, okay, now let's say the two vectors we're talking about, one is in your head. It's the state of your mind. Mm. And the other one is in my head. Mm. It's the state of my mind. Uh, um, All right, and so now I'm we've got trying common to... ground is the stuff maybe that we have in common, right? Where we have the same and... bit values, and the other everything else is places where we may have different, I don't know, experience that's right. or expectations or knowledge or whatever happens. Exactly, to you. exactly. And, and that's where so we need now to talk, I, I guess. exactly. <laughs> so I have this goal of conveying a bit vector to you, or I have a goal of having conveyed a memory or an experience or something like that. And I want you to have that too. I, and so that we can talk about it like that. So I am going to make, take my bit vector and make a description of it, serialize it, turn it into buzz, 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 and send it through the air to you. And it's going to hit your eardrums and go buzz, 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 buzz. And all this stuff is going to happen. And it's going to implicitly create a subspace where the common ground matches up uh, and that'll just sit there. And then there'll be all of these other things. You know, Dave is saying this. I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. But the closest thing I can think of he might mean by that is he's talking about like kids. So I, I think he's talking about kids or whatever it is. And so the idea is we could imagine communication between people or between any, between other machinery as being a process of inducing a, a, creating a deliberate subspace that the receiver is now going to be at some point within like that. And if we're lucky, if we've picked a way of expressing whatever it is that we're trying to communicate that uh, has a lot of overlap so that there's a, a lot of match. There's only a few places where it doesn't line up. Then that'll do a good job. Then, then it, they will have an idea, which is in a very small subspace and the overall context, the, what do we call the common ground that mm. you said uh, uh, would be uh, easy to agree on. There'll be lots of common ground. Mm. Um, as opposed to, uh, you know, people who are completely coming at it from different points of view. Like, for example, if I'm speaking, you know, Latvian and, and you don't understand Latvian, uh, I, I can buzz, buzz, biz all along and I'm not going to have much luck creating a common ground, a subspace, a small subspace. Though I think Latvian is going to be really popular in the year 3000. Well, I think, you know, there was some interbreeding maybe that actually got happened. It, with the aliens uh, um and anyway so so that's the hyper subspace idea that it would be a useful way to think about machines that are communicating with each other as 
the, the, the nature, the purpose of the communication is to create a bit vector in the receiver in sort of a temporary holding area where they can kind of inspect it and say, this is what the other person is saying. And if we imagine that, then there's this kind of, this is what they're saying and this is what I believe. And there's the two bit vectors and there's the implicit subspace formed by every place that they disagree. And what's going to happen is, is the receiver who gets this is going to try to resolve the uh, points of disagreement. They're going to say, well, if I assume by smaller than a bread box, you mean a, a gigantic piece of bread. Well, <laughs> then I could understand it or, 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 or like that. And then, then what's happening is the machine, the receiving machine is now doing a hill climbing process within that subspace, trying to find something that makes sense, trying to find a high probability interpretation set of settings, because maybe green small doesn't happen, red big does happen, and so forth. And if they succeed in finding uh, something that makes sense, something that seems highly likely, then they think, ah, I've understood what the other one is saying. And then they can they can echo it back. They say, well, you know, I need to, to have a particularly big loaf of bread, but then I get what you're saying. Hmm. Uh, or not. Okay? So that's the idea. That's the idea that uh, we are machines. And we are interacting with each other by essentially serializing these descriptions of bit vectors, which then get deserialized and um, the subspace is created and the receiver then hill climbs in that subspace, trying to keep all the common ground the same and saying, well, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense. That oh, Did you mean this? Uh, um, like that. Does that all make right. any sense? Well, so, okay, so so I, th I feel like there's a conflict between this notion of hill climbing to high probability combinations and the earlier, what I thought was an assumption that everything's uniform. Yes. Uh, uh, right, because if everything's uniform, then everything is equally likely. Once you've, once you've specified some of the bit positions, the other ones can be anything and there's no preferences. But in, right. in the real world, th things tend to correlate. They, there tends to be like chunks that hang together. So if uh, you're, you know, you're trying to describe some kind of movie to me, and it has, you know, it's animated, then you know that, I'm that more brings a whole bunch of other right. It could be for kids, or it could be a kind of a foreign kind of anime, uh, uh -huh. you know, arty film. Um, but it's right. probably not an actual adventure film because those tend to be live action. So I'd be surprised. Even if you don't, you know, even if you don't give me any other sure. values, I want sure. it to fault out to uh, these other categories. So right. then it's it's clearly non-uniform. Right. So here's the thing: um, when we said everything in the hyperspace was equally likely, that was our assumption as speakers. It, it wasn't actually a correct description of reality. Uh, and just as you say, in reality, there's going to be all of these low order, high order dependencies that if you answer these questions, that really pretty much answers those other questions as well. Mm -hmm. But they just looked like part of the subspace. They looked independent. And so here's the second part of the stuff I've been thinking about, uh, um, which is, you know, what's the way to start the story? And... You know, a lot of times when people talk about starting the story, they talk about like physics and the Big Bang. <laughs> That's where the story should begin. Or if it's religion, it starts with God and the word. That's where the story begins. That sort of thing. And my idea is where the story should begin is with the sentence, the stated sentence. And the reason is, is because a sentence, natural language, is program. It's a programming language. Natural language is a kind of programming language. And by saying things to each other and producing subspaces and all that kind of stuff, we're trying to program each other. Uh, um, and so when we say we're, I'm trying, or trying to create a subspace, I'm inducing a subspace of green and small and red and big. Uh, um, I'm thinking as a programmer, 
I'm building a data structure and I make the assumption that the hyperspace is all equally likely because I'm ignorant, because I don't actually know what the receiver is going to do with it, what exact history they've got, whether they've ever seen anime or uh, whether all live action adventure they ever saw was Superman cartoons or, you know, who knows what uh, uh, like that. So the framework that I'm coming at is, you know, you you can try to describe the world by saying it began with the Big Bang and protons and neutrons and all that. Or you can try to describe the world by saying it comes from the mind of God or whatever it is like that. But I say another way to do it in a way that I think has some value that we don't really appreciate. We as humans don't really appreciate as much as we could, that it would be helpful if we could make this other position more explicit rather than just kind of floating under the hood. And this position is we are programmers. We are coders. We're coders. And sometimes we're the machine uh, like that. And so it's not that what makes us so special is not that we can learn, although we can, and what makes us so special is not that we can talk, although we can. Uh, uh, what makes us so special is that we can talk and learn and program and be programmed. And that's why we win. That's why we're the baddest macroscopic creatures uh, on the planet. Uh, uh, Wait, like did you that. throw that in as a nod to COVID? Uh, I, I, just a little humility, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I. Uh, so my wife has been listening to the computing ups uh, uh, a lot lately, and she was saying, you know, oh, you anticipated the pandemic two years ago, and I said, well, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, um, and and she said, I had a, I had a line where you know maybe maybe our whole civilization is just the time between the plagues. Uh, um, and well, you know, so I always want to make room for there's living systems just because they're not bigger and meaner than us doesn't mean they won't wipe us out. Uh, um, okay, all right, all right. So not to get too hung up on that point. Um, all right, so all right, we are coders, and right, and that's that gives us power. That gives us an ability to manipulate our environment and each other at at unprecedented degrees. Exactly. And it means that if we know, if we are good coders, uh, and we can write programs that are widely executable, and we can get a communication channel that allows this program to spread, then we can make tremendous changes. We can get a tremendous amount of work done directed work done simply by going buzz, 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 uh, uh, like that. And that's really what I want to focus on. That's, that's, you know, so it leads to, well, it's like memes. Sh sure. But also it's mass media. It's who controls the channels of communication and who is it that in fact is programming us? Who is it that in fact is broadcasting this code over and over and over again and to what end there is. So okay, my hope right. is, so is, is that let me, let me, let me process a little bit. So, uh, okay. So I, so <laughs> what comes first is the sentence. So when you say the sentence, you weren't talking about a specific <laughs> sentence. You were talking about the concept that the, Sentences, language is this incredibly powerful force for molding the minds of others and therefore engaging the others in their in, in, in an ability to work towards our goals, our ends, right? So we yeah. the force and multiplier. So if you want to explain what happens in the world, in our world, in the real world of the earth, you should begin with programming and programming languages. Because that's going to explain more about what happens, the big changes that happen in our world, than neutrons and electrons. Okay, 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 okay. I, I see what you're going for now. So it's if you want to tell the story of 
who we are and where we are and what's going on, you could start that story with the beginning of the universe. And right. there's a lot to be learned from that. <laughs> a lot sure. happened really before we had any, any sure. role in it whatsoever. But Absolutely. we're kind of a, we're kind of a, uh, I don't know, 800 pound gorilla. Like we're having a big influence, at least in our corner of the universe. Right. And so our story, the story that's most relevant to us needs to start, or maybe you're arguing should start with, what makes us human, right? And so to you, that is then expressed in the form of our ability to, I don't know, not to put too fine a point on it, but manipulate each other through yeah. words. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to, All right. to, to program each other to do work to our ends. Uh, right. Um, and, and, and to me, it's not even important directly what it means to be human uh, uh, what's important is what affordances mm. do the existences of humans give me as a coder like that so this is okay, this is a particular worldview now right that says yes. basically i'm a programmer and the rest of the world especially all the people it in it are my computer. Is the machine. Yeah. That's okay. right. All right, right. So, and, and, and I want to laugh at that because it's so ridiculous, but then I can't anymore because it's actually just so warp, mind warping and kind of right, you know? Like, yeah. so, so to me, I recently had a thought, which is, I was watching my daughter um, who ran a musical. She directed a musical, uh, uh -huh. I don't know, back in the time when... You, there used to be this thing called theater. People did that. Yeah. Um, she she directed a show, and the main thing that she had to do was wrangle, I think it was 50 other people. So there was like 25 people in the cast and 25 people in the crew, and they're all college students, and they have their own things going on and their own sure. things going on. And, <laughs> and she had to somehow wrangle everybody towards this common goal of making the show actually happen. Right. And it struck me, first of all, that she's really good at it. And second of all, of all the things that we learn in school and in life, the ability to wrangle 50 people towards a common goal is maybe the most important and the least taught. Right. So it's the least such explicitly a taught. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Well, uh, yeah, taught, uh, taught, as opposed to people absorb it. Obviously, some people absorb it better than others, but it's important right. to all of us. So, okay, so I, so I guess I'm kind of prepared for your message by this this background that says, yeah, man, this is like this is the way you get things done is by essentially talking other people into doing them with you. Right, right. And, you know, I feel like when I bring up this kind of language, people think, oh, you know, it's so manipulative, it's so unethical. And, and my feeling is <clears throat> it may or may not be manipulative or unethical, but that's kind of a separate issue because it's <laughs> what we're doing all the time. So I yeah. want to say that it's, it's, it's an open, it's, it's, it could be ethical or it could be unethical. Absolutely. But it's definitely manipulative. I don't see how it could not be manipulative because it's very explicitly trying to, you know, mold and change the behavior sure. of others. So I feel like I feel, I feel like you have to own that. Yeah, I do. Uh, it's just I'm saying there's no alternative. There's no way right, to right, open right, your right, mouth right. that isn't alt manipulative. Right. That everything that we're doing all the time is some form of this. So you you know you're that's right. You come you come in after a long day and a, and a family member says how was your day and you tell them stuff. You are changing their brains. You are changing their state of knowledge. And you might not and have a particular specific goal in mind, right? You might be, not be trying well, to get anything from them. But, well, but, but there's a default, which is you're amplifying what was in your own head. You're making another copy of your day's experience in their head, uh, uh, which is a manipulation. It's a mm. programming. You're trying to store the facts of whatever you did that day <laughs> in their head. So in case you get hit by a bus, someone else could ask them and they could say, Oh yeah, well, he just went to the bank and then he did what da, 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 like, right, that. right. So this is what, this is what I was apologizing for at the beginning of the conversation is that you, you transmitted a bunch of those things to me, which I now remember <laughs> as, well, then he said a thing to the other thing and it was about another thing, but you know, well, but the upshot yeah. of it was Dave said something clever. 
So yeah, you're, you're welcome. Which for is that which story. is good. So the so the program worked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, high dimensional programs can have many purposes, mm. and people who are good at programming are never trying to just add two and two. They're trying to add two and two and impress somebody that they knew how to add two and two and mm. get them to want to do something, blah, 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 you know, uh, like that. And so I, you know, I think. One of the reasons why this seems so mechanical and, and, uh, unesthetic and unhuman is because we are imagining these incredibly simple, uh, uh, programs, uh, that, uh, are obviously exploitive and are, are win lose. Uh, the, re- the receiver loses. They get, they get, they do work and don't get to benefit for it and so on. When of course that's not necessarily the case at all. That's making the same mistake as thinking that evolution is always red in tooth and claw rather than full of cooperation, full of collaboration, full of building and programming each other to build the pyramids. Well, it would be nice if it wasn't slaves, but, uh, uh other forms of collaboration where there's, uh, you know, more peer to peer aspects to it is absolutely programming too but uh, it can be win-win so that's why it seems you know the 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 morality or the ethics of this Mm -hmm. programming act has to be computed separately it's not just because you're trying to be manipulative it's bad Mm -hmm. well one thing that really resonates with me about this perspective that you're describing is it puts I don't know what I think of as reinforcement learning at the center um, of, of, you know, of existence is like, there's, it's, there's always rewards. There's always goals. You're always trying to do something and everything else is kind of secondary to, well, how are you getting those things done? And when I hear, you know, sort of common or common is the wrong word. What's, what's the right word? So just the the, the typical responses, the typical ways that a, a machine learning person thinks about the world is that, oh, no, no, it's mostly about statistics. It's mostly about understanding patterns and so forth. And, you know, if you do all that really well, maybe you could layer some goal stuff on top of that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I like I, that always feels wrong to me. It's like, well, why yeah, are too. you doing anything if, you're, if, if it isn't for a purpose? You know, the purpose right. can't just be because I want to understand, right? Well, the understanding is only going to pay off if it can be useful in some way. If it can be line. turned into a doing. If it can turn into an action. Yeah. So that, yeah, that definitely resonates with me. Yeah. Well, and that was the argument I had with Jeff Hinton back when I was a grad student. That's exactly who I was thinking of. And and to to some degree, Jan LeCun. He was all about leading this effort. Right. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, no, just he was all about learning and interpreting and categorizing and all that. And I said, well, even suppose you did all of that perfectly, mm-hmm. you would have solved exactly half the problem, <laughs> uh, which is it wouldn't tell you anything about what to do what about it in order to accomplish your ends. And so this whole approach of we are coders, we are coders, Mm. sometimes we're the machine, Uh, uh, we are coders, is taking that other half of it. Begin with we are acting in the world, we are doing things in the world. And so we have to place our bets. We have to say, okay, here's this, here's here. I have this set of choices, what I can do, what looks best to me, and do it. And in computation, in traditional computation, where things are deterministic, you know exactly what will happen. You just, you don't have to really think about it. It doesn't feel like placing a bet. You say add two and two, you're really, really sure you're going to get four. But in, once you move beyond determinism, which has been my whole thing for the last decade and more, now it's like the whole, there's this notion in computer security of what's called a weird machine. And the idea is, is that even if a computer is completely deterministic, step by step by step by step, just by filling memory up with program code, uh, if you find, if you find a bug where you can make things go wrong, you can now start stitching together a couple of instructions from here and then make a couple of instructions from there and create a whole new program that had nothing to do with what was originally there, but it will absolutely do work for you. It will send spam. It will take passwords, whatever you want. And so the takeaway is that reality is a weird machine. Mm. It, reality is this thing that has all of these things that we could do. We could program reality to do work for us if we just have the wit to figure out the weird machine program. 
And it's not limited to people, but people are this huge amplifier, this huge, I mean, there are these programmable machines out there that can do a ton of work. You mean computers? <laughs> people. Oh, people. Uh, people. Uh, we got 7 billion, 8 billion, whoever it is, uh, uh, that it can't all speak the same programming language. So that's a problem. But uh, uh, they, you know, that can do an incredible amount of work to the planet that could all be coordinated if we could get programs to them that would fit, that would land in a, create a hyper subspace to which they would hill climb to the same action and they would do something that would help the goals of the one who sent the program out. And that's where self-fulfilling uh, positive feedback loops can be born. And other than then they can start repeating the program and propagating it further and so on. Okay. And so that's for the bringing idea. it back to the hyper subspace thing, which is the other question that I had. It's like, okay, wait. <laughs> I feel like we had two different conversations. But you're saying uh, the hyper subspace thing is specifically about the, the communicative act. And the communicative yes. act is also – a form of programming because it's not just changing the bits it's changing the bits that generate behavior so exactly you're, you're actually right. impacting behavior right so okay and so maybe we should okay go ahead go ahead no no uh, we, i was gonna we, say we've we already should, gone over should, yeah maybe we should wind down and 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 let it set the <laughs> stage for a conversation that i've been wanting to have for you or with you for for a really long time which is to what end like what is the ultimate goal because this kind of perspective that says, well, everything that we're doing, all the talking that we're doing, all the interacting that we're doing, it's all because we're trying to accomplish something. I would like right. to talk to you about, well, why? What are we actually trying it's to like, accomplish? It's like, so what? What's the, uh, uh -huh. yeah. Right. Yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, spoiler alert, it's to make society better by getting improved common ground. To get, mm -hmm. to get language out there, to make it easier for people to see when they're being programmed and to see who's being, doing the programming and to take part in the game mm -hmm. and so forth, rather than just having the, having reality pulled over their eyes, uh, uh, by the ones who are outplaying them. Okay. It's well, that to... raises more questions than answers, but we have, <laughs> We That's will set point. aside some time to to dive into those. Um, All so, right. Yeah. Okay. So you're gonna really gonna make this, uh, you know, lesson two because it sounds well. Sounds it, you know, First lesson, it, and I, I yeah. recommend it to everybody. It is weird, but it's also very cool, and the production value is is reasonable, and it's uh, <laughs> it's fun. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed watching it. I just was left at well, the end with like, why is he doing this to us? Um, and I think uh -huh. that there's there's a journey that we're going on, and and I'm and I'm you know excited to see where it goes. I, I'm I'm trying. the The problem is, is I can never do anything without a deadline, and these internally motivated things have no well established deadline. So what I thought I would maybe do is put out a teaser trailer for uh, episode two with a date on it, uh, mm -hmm. um, and then actually publish it. So now I'm on the record as saying, episode you know lecture two, January 2021. Uh, um, and then I will have to do it. Uh, right. Then you think backwards to, okay, well, what am I doing now? So that, that so I won't right. hit that date and be sad that I missed it. Exactly. And so I started doing that. I started building timelines and working backwards and it's like, I should try this stuff out with Michael. That's what All I right. should do today. Oh, this is part uh, of that uh, timeline. Very cool. <laughs> this is a part of the timeline. Uh, uh, and so I, so thanks, thank you very much, uh, for listening. I, I hope it, it made any kind of sense. Uh, um, and, uh, if, if, if people are, are, are interested, they, they should, they should bug me. They should say, you know, mm. yeah. Oh, hey, looking it forward to lecture two. Uh, uh, and then <laughs> that'll certainly, uh, uh, put the fear of embarrassment in me. Uh, 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 uh. Anyway, okay. Okay, so don't forget to put a link to lesson one in this. In this I will episode. put a link to lesson one in our little blurb, uh, um, and we'll take it from there. Thank you for sharing and for expanding well, our minds. <laughs> oh. To well, make room well, for your for own listening. crap. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that, hey, you cleaned well, out my refrigerator. It's... Wait a second. What's all this new stuff in here? Yeah, yeah. There, actually, there's a whole, a whole bigger refrigerator behind it now uh, that we just hadn't <laughs> noticed before. So we got tons more room available now. Okay. Love it. We'll talk again. Thanks, Dave.
This was Computing Up. Thanks for listening.